your question. All right, we are live now. Hello, today I do a special special webinar on the subject of death and sickness. Uh, this was mostly because uh, Jim had to go uh, to his hometown in Pennsylvania where his dad is in critical condition in intensive care and uh, obviously there is a fear of death and the subject of death coming up. And just by coincidence when I announced the webinar uh, I was put I was about to put the date and I just realized, I already placed the date and I read it was, it said Friday, June 13th, so Friday 13th is an interesting combination. And after that, um, even more, I received a letter that my friend died. Um, he is a nice gentleman, a Reiki master who is very enlightened, very, very enlightened. Uh, one of the channelers uh, here in Rochester, a psychic. Um, he just discovered, you know, we discovered that he has cancer of extend, ex, you know, an extreme stage and he just died. So with that, um, I guess uh, Jim's father is is alive, and I will ask Sephira to read the message we got just today from Jim. Uh, I posted that uh, that note on the website, and many of you, more than twelve people, have uh, wrote nice words to Jim. Uh, and now we got. Uh, I spoke to him yesterday. He called me, and now uh, Sephira got a text message from him. Sephira, do you mind reading the text message? Are you muted? Okay, sorry. Yes. Jim would like to express his gratitude to everybody because he tangibly feels your support and your prayers and your positive thoughts for him. And his dad is, uh, is um, he's able to speak with his dad and today he's getting a full examination because there seems to be internal bleeding and they don't know why and so he's getting a full checkup today. So that's the current situation. But, but Jim would really mostly, rather than talk about his dad, um, because I asked him about his dad, but he just wanted to say to all of you, thank you very much for your energy, your love, and your support. So I, uh, I am in that subject for, for a long time. And it's not my favorite subject, but uh, it is a subject which comes up frequently. I'm uh, 50 years old, and uh, I witnessed and was part of, uh, of many of those events. And uh, I'm now the oldest in my family, and uh, so I have had to, to, you know, to my, myself to go through understanding what what is there. And another part of uh, my understanding, it's a very essential part of my understanding, was at some point 15 years ago maybe I realized that in doing my genealogical research that I come from a long chain of religious priests, Jewish religious priests called rabbis. And just thinking about what rabbis do or any priests do, they welcome people to this world, they officiate the welcoming of births in, in Jewish tradition, it would be circumcision on the around first week of life. And then uh, and then they marry people and then they officiate their their the death rituals, whatever, whatever, whatever is a commemoration of uh, of life of the person, sometime after death, so so funerals and stuff of that sort. So that's their daily routine, and um, and they live long lives, and uh, that's what they do. That's what their main purpose in life to help others, to service others. So that that helped me a lot, understanding that I'm not the first one who survives that. It's not something very positive, but. Uh, 
you make it what 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 you wish to do with it. Just a second, it will make a sound better. How is the sound now? Okay, so um, so th so one of the approaches there is a lot of angles to look at death, and one of the approaches is to look from perspective of someone who faces it every day and uh, and have to get used to that. Again, any event as Bashar says, any information is initially neutral. It is your belief system which makes it good or bad or tragic or emotionally charged. I'm not saying it's good, but I want to place it in a perspective which is proper for it. And I will start with, uh, with a blessing for Jim specifically and, and let's go. It would be improvised blessing. Mm. Jim, our friend, we send you our love and appreciation. We support you in the difficult moments of your life we have now. Take it easy. Don't be harmed. Do what is expected from you. But don't like to pull you down. Be like a bubble. Whatever happens, raise up. Be like a bubble and grow with whatever happens to you. Raise your vibration. Become more vibrant. Become more successful. Be a healer. Give your healing to your dad. Give your, your healing to the relatives. Be a healer to them. Be a support to them. Accept life as it is. Accept death for what it is. Don't let it to pull you down. Death is black. Death is white. Life is rainbow. Ra life is blue, green, purple, red. Any color of rainbow except black. Be with life. Be a healer. Help others in this difficult moment. We support your belief in God. We endorse your belief in God. May your belief in God become a link to God. May your belief in God become a knowledge of God. Make this knowledge and this link become unity with God. God comes here to visit briefly this physical world and to look at this through our eyes. Help God to experience what we experience. It's not your responsibility to make everyone happy. It's not your responsibility to make your dad happy. It is your responsibility to be near, send healing and love. But that's where it stops. Be what you are. Let 
the death or not the death. Let anything that happens to you to reveal yourself what and who you are. Accept it as it is. Let it be as it should be. Let it be as it should be. Let it be as it should. Whatever happens, may that reveal to you who you are and shine brighter in that light. Whatever happens, you now will be more of yourself. The physical body of your dead might be not with you, but he, his soul will be always with you. Whenever he chooses to leave, that's his choice. Be near, send love, and if he wants to stay, stay, welcome that. If he wants to leave, welcome that. Whatever happens, it's their choice, and you can provide your honest support. Let their moment, let that experience unite you and your friends and your relative and raise the vibration of all. Let that be, let it make whatever happens to be more beautiful, more in harmony with the nature and with everything, the God and the all. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Max. All right. Amen. Now I invite you to speak. I need a little breath. If you have any questions or topics, mm -hmm. bring it up. I was. I had the when you were talking about before you said the blessing about everybody having a different feeling and attitude about death. Or it depends on our perspectives and uh, the death and life. I don't really, I wish there was another word for death, transformation <laughs> and life, or the transformations that life goes through. A stage of life, let's put it like that. <laughs> One of the stages of life um, is, is happening constantly. The leaves, there's a leaves outside, maybe they're dying, maybe some insects are dying, maybe it's just like a constant movement of life and death all the time. And I, I think the only thing that makes people sad about death is that they missing they'll miss the people who they feel close to, and I think that's the hardest thing about that kind of transformation. Is a person intellectually we know they're there. Maybe some people feel them spiritually after they pass, but still that person is not around to, to physically talk with and hang out with, especially when it's your parents. You know, going home is always like the one place you can just <laughs> be you and, you know, no expectations, or usually, not all the time. So, yeah. But Thank my you. main, yeah, my main imagery was that it's a constant, just, I don't know how to describe what I saw, but, yeah, you, you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, on yeah, the topic, was, go ahead. Brian, go ahead. Gonna, I was going to expand on what Sophia was saying. It's a, a reevaluation, a reintegration, is really what it is. Because you have a, a life review when you pass over it, and reevaluating that and reintegrating that, which we call uh, coming back into the physical form. So yes, it's um, it's beautiful, Sophia. How you say that? Mm, really? Thank you. Yeah. So. Um, thank you, Brian. Speaking about thank you about that feeling of missing the person. Uh, I had a very revealing question from uh, my um, hybrid daughter, which is from four dimension, not here, somewhere up there in a colony one. When one of the first times when it came through, maybe the first time came through, maybe that was the first question she asked me was, why are you so sad? And I was surprised by that question. I didn't feel that I'm particularly sad. And and that was very revealing. She asks very important questions, which transformed my life substantially. So, and then there was another thing, which uh, Angel Gahil, when I spoke to the angel, he asked, why am I depressed? And he said, it is 
a fear. It is, you're depressed because you're afraid. So I was trying to figure out what that sadness is about because I have the higher perspective why I'm still sad. And finally I defined it that the sadness is because of missed opportunities. So sometimes you just see the opportunity was there and it's not there anymore. And that is the quality of death. Um, there was an opportunity there, but, you know, and many things can be fixed. Many diseases can be healed. Many problems can be solved. But, you know, the one, th one, the one thing which is not reversible is death. In this scenario, in this life, in this timeline, you know, whatever happened already happened. And it will not happen anymore if the person is dead. So that is one thing which is, you know, unforgivable of death is that opportunity is gone. Um, you know, I'm not saying that death is good. I'm not saying it's too much to that dark or too much to the light. It's somewhere where it is. I want to place it in the proper place. It is an unhappy moment. Opportunities are gone. We come here for experiences. Uh, and Experience of death is essential, but but you know if somebody dies, you know a lot of other opportunities are gone. You can't experience that. You cannot experience that. So so death death is something very very profound. Mm. Another thing you mentioned afterlife. Um, Yes, the main source of information I got was uh, the books by Michael Newton called Life, The Journey of Souls and what's the second name of the second book? Can it, uh, anybody bring it up on Amazon so we can all look at that if it's easy for you? Is there any computer geek? Uh. I think it's <coughs> Destiny, Destiny yes, of Souls. Destiny of Souls and Journey of Souls. I would like to show people, I mean, I think these are very profound book, books and very true. So the main message there, as we all know, is that it's not that we have a soul. It is that so the soul has a physical experience. So the the our life is a very small part of the experience of the soul. We are just like in a computer game with a, that hero that in a computer game. When the game starts, the soul is that little hero in a computer game, little character. And when the life ends, that character is gone, but the soul continues its life. That is, you know, very profound understanding. I have a uh, fam a family of friends here in Rochester who are our know, great friends of Jim and I, and they, ha they, ha they host this Reiki share event every Friday. So we go there every Friday and we do Reiki on each other. There is a big, mm, how do you call it, a community of about 50 to 100 people who, you know, about 10 of them meet every Friday. And once we just learned that um, a mother of this uh, man has has died, and they were enlightened people, true light workers with lots lots of experience. They are like older than I. And it was very surprising to me to see how they take it. It was it wasn't much grief. I basically, they kind of almost ignored it. There was no. Uh, I think that word is condolences. There is no expression of condolences. People kind of gave a hug, but didn't even discuss that. I guess that would be one of the approaches to this, just just to to almost ignore it. It's just a transition. The main part was the life, and now it is transition. And after that, it's uh, it's up to you if you keep the connection, especially for Jim. And for other channelers, for other psychics, the conversation continues. You can convert. Uh, it sometimes it could be even stronger that in uh, during the life you don't have a good, good report with that person sometimes. And when the person is gone, you might get a better communication than before life was ended. 
I invite a little of your comments and then I'll continue. On the, on the subject of debt, um, I think it's uh, more of our expectation about this subject, about debt, because we expect people to live, but we don't expect them to die. We have a hard time expecting people to die um, and we don't want to talk about it and we don't even want to we don't we don't even want to think about them someday they may die so that you know from our conscious go to our subconscious and we don't want to deal with it uh, I was talking to this lady her husband died 10 years ago and I could see in her face when still she was talking about her husband she after like 10 years she was still grieving about her husband death so she really had a hard time uh, accepting her husband's death but then I thought to myself well this lady when you know when she got married to her husband didn't she think that someday he may die? Didn't she expect that someday she may, he may die? So obviously not. Obviously she didn't, she didn't want to deal with it or she didn't want to think about it. So this is, this is our expectation about you know, people. We don't want them to, we don't want to accept that they, they die someday. Thank you. Yes, I guess it is very cultural, very much uh, of uh, modern culture. It's not even Western culture. It's everywhere. It is in the West, in the East, in Russia, in Europe, in uh, China, even in India, uh, even Philippines, you know, everywhere, in South America, I would say. Most of the modern cultures have, have that sort of relation to death. I mean Christianity obviously affected a lot of that and Judaism as well. Judaism then Christianity affected a lot of but then there is a modern outlook on death. Extraterrestrials, I, I, I speak to them quite often about you know how they take death and how do they take birth. Um, almost never they have that much respect or that much attention to the question of death as, as we do. And the reason there is they don't lose telepathic connection. Uh, they can communicate to the spirit even after the physical body is gone. Uh, many of extraterrestrial races, they uh, they just change bodies, they, the, the experience continues. Basically, when you change body and you're born, even when you're still in the womb as a fetus, you, you have the full consciousness. It's called full consciousness, consciousness being, being, like one of those would be Jesus who was always conscious. Uh, not all their higher beings incarnating here were full, fully conscious. I was I think I was speaking to Lakesh once and he said that Buddha chose not to be fully conscious so he was born and he didn't remember but then he kind of awake awoken to awoke to um was awoken to his um or awakened I'm sorry uh to his um uh, his uh, his nature but for Jesus it, you know he 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 was aware of all that all the time even during the birth uh, and we are not fully conscious, not at all. We are very partially conscious, and our body wouldn't even tolerate full consciousness. We can open, open, and open to more of ourselves, but um, our body is only can hold only that amount of vibration between you know four and six, and then above six is almost intolerable for human body in this environment. So yes, I uh, another experience was my uh, another hybrid child up there. Um, 
I had a conversation with him while sti he still was a fetus in the womb. Uh, he was channeled by, uh, through this do through Jim, channeled to me, and we had a conversation. And that was very profound. When you can speak to a, ch a, fe uh, a soul of the fetus and understand that it is a very adult soul, it understands everything, it, you have a completely different look at, at life and death. That was very profound. And obviously, I spoke to several spirits after that, again, through channelers and medium, or before and after that. So, so that was also very profound. That is the nature of spiritualist church in America. If you haven't been to spiritualist church services, just Google for spiritualist church and uh, come to their service. It is a mediumship service, a mediumship. Uh, the main part of the service is uh, mediumship where the people sit in a circle typically and uh, human discarnate spirits, the uh, spirits of human not, which are not physically with us, come and speak. Usually relatives come or friends and they speak and deliver messages. And that is also very profound. Uh, another thing is there is, I have several books of uh, communications from the other world and these are very well documented communications. Uh, the longest rec uh, reported phone conversation was a phone call from the other world which lasted for half an hour. Uh, the person died but uh, after a few hours after death there was a phone call and, uh, and uh, another, you know, another person, live person received that conversation after the, the death and uh, uh, he didn't even realize that he's speaking to a person after death. Or maybe it was uh, multiple realities, but basically there are phone calls when people call from the other world and, and speak to their close ones through telephone. Usually it's very short, but, but it's very profound. There are some recorded conversations, and most of the evidence comes uh, through hospice workers, uh, nurses who deal with the death daily, in their you know, medical institutions. And many of them are psychic and they can see spirits coming and meeting the, the person when the person leaves the body. And it's very formal, it's quite structured, uh, it's a very standardized way of transition uh, and very well studied and documented. And uh, sometimes the person leaves and they, they by some reason give an extension and they come back and continue. So it is a life after death sort of experience uh, or temporary death or something of that sort. Um, I witnessed my own, uh, had my own experience, a couple, couple of personal experiences which were very revealing. Uh, one was with my very dear older relative. Uh, we were in the room and she was just laying, laying, oh, I wasn't present there. I, I, I was told the story afterwards. So uh, I was, I was just, I, I wasn't in that room at that moment, but I came soon after. So, so what happened uh, when I was visiting, uh, these are two old sisters, like 80 years old, around 80 years old sisters. So one, one of them uh, said to another that, uh, literally she said, they came after me. I will go now. And I see them and say hi. So she already saw uh, the welcome party of, of spirits who are welcoming her for transition. And another sister, basically, she used her willpower. She was a very powerful person, uh, will will powerful person. And she said, nope, it's not time for you to go. I, I reject that. I disagree. Stay with us. I need you longer. Please stay with me now and let say that you will, you know, do it later. And they accepted it because she was very powerful in many ways and spiritually as well. And that lasted for another maybe a few months. And then she, she was gone. So that was for real. That was, you know, I, I was witnessing, you know, the results of that few hours later when, uh, you know, both of them were, were here and... Uh, in physical and both of them were alive and they just told me that story. And it was very, very real. Um, another story about afterlife was, 
I mean, that's a scientific question, but it's also a very practical question, is what to do with the people who are, it's called like vegetables on artificial life support. Are they still there or not? Is their soil still there or not? So, so um, my, I was at that spiritualist church service where spirits were coming and going. And there was one lady who had, at that moment, her husband was near death. So she especially came to, you know, for, what's it word? For healing, basically. That is a word for spiritual help, emotional help there. So her husband was in the hospital. He was still alive. And, but, but he was in critical condition, maybe not conscious already. I think he wasn't conscious. I think he had a stroke and he wasn't conscious. He was like in coma state. But he was still, body was still alive. So a spirit came who was his relative and the spirit said that the soul of this gentleman, her husband, already arrived and they're celebrating. And he passes his love to her. So the body was still there, but the soul is already gone. That was also very profound. She said that it's already it's already here, we're already very happy. And that's what Bashar says. You know, while here you're full of grief and you're full of tragic emotions, know that on the other side there is a celebration. That's a birth, that's a welcoming party. And this welcoming party is described in many other books and, and uh, histories like uh, of witnesses and life regressions on, and uh, telepathic, no telepathic, hypnotic regressions of the sort. So welcome, welcoming parties are often very bright and profound and um, you know friends, they, they, they have that all the time, the person goes and the person comes back and they all welcome him, whoever is not on duty right now. So the time there and there is seven dimension. It's uh, seven dimensions to third dimension, seven dimension to third dimension. So they kind of dive here. And seven dimension is a spirit world and they dive here in third dimension for the physical life and come back. The time there is different but it is linked to this time. Let me draw you a picture. So here it's linear more or less. And there it is not that linear, but there is one-to-one -one correspondence. Let me show that. So here is linear, and you go from here to there. And time there is different. They can it's much more flexible, but from here time point there to time point here, there is one-to-one -one correspondence, more or less. They can look up they can see a little bit ahead, and the farther ahead they see, the more diffuse it becomes, because there are multiple timelines and multiple uh, uh, choices. You make choices, so actually your time is fixed here, but but at every point you, you're making choices, and uh, so it uh, branches into multiple branches. So they can see some of the branches, but uh, only rarely, like if there is something really fixed, these branches converge. So there is some convergence. So they can see a very essential point that is predetermined, pre-chosen from you. But but it's very rare, and also uh, that can also be flexible. It it can be predetermined, but there is so much of free choice and so much involvement of higher beings which can change the whole scenario. So. It's not fully predetermined. It's kind of probability-defined determination. Okay, so uh, th so th why do they, you know, even on seven dimension, very spiritually high dimension, why do they have that that one-to-one -one correspondence? So from here they kind of arrive to this life, they live the life, they they live the life, then they leave from here, return back, and they have the time there. Why is that? I will invite your your uh, insights, if you have any.
you saying what uh, was the time difference or uh, say it again? Uh, just oh, my question is not clear. Okay, um, my question is why is that on the seventh dimension that they have the their time linked to our time? Why don't they have completely different uh, free life of us from us? Uh, I think it's just a perception, isn't it? I think everything happens in the now, doesn't it? Um, yeah, that's a familiar uh, teaching from many beings, and I think they a little bit overstretch that idea. I somewhat disagree. Somewhat, di somewhat agree, but somewhat disagree. Yes, it is now. From from a certain perspective, everything is now. I mean, from their perspective. But again, uh, I spoke to the beings up there. Especially, yeah, yeah. I had that question. You know, to every dimension I speak to, I'm asking: uh, Is uh, do you have some sort of replacement for our time? Do you have future and the past? And are you, and in which way are you changing? And especially, in, like most of my conversations about time war with with Lakesh, he has a nice perspective on that. So the answer is. Or the question is, why do they have the time link to ours? Like our now corresponds to their now, and then sometime later, our now corresponds to their now. Why is that? Do Max, you have an insight? Yes. Um, I've I've been told a few things. Um, some of this has been from Roxy. Some of it from Nick. Um, yeah. Some of it from from um, personal ET friends as well. Um, the way I've been told and kind of understand it is that. Time is is kind of like a squiggly line, like you've put, and uh -huh. we we've as the humanity have grabbed the, the edges of it and stretched it into a linear perspective. Uh huh. Uh huh. But our stretching of it doesn't actually affect the the uh, shape of the time. We just perceive it in a different way, and yes. each of these lines they they're kind of like hundreds and thousands of different squiggly lines that yes. overlap at different points. So yes. that we'll, we'll always be crossing in between different timelines and making, making the options, kind of like the, um, the arrow symbol that you've mm -hmm. uh, made at the bottom on the linear. Yes, uh, yes. The, these lines will also cross to other lines, and then they will feed back to the linear timeline that we are perceiving at the moment. And from my understanding is we can actually, if we, if we decide to... Uh, Choose not to believe in linear time. We mm -hmm. can we can uh, choose where we end up on the line. So we can go back to past life in, in this current form. So we can go back to our child um, child memories and pick out things that we've done. Maybe an option that we uh, we wanted to choose, and we can take bits from that timeline that we may not have actually crossed into, and still feed the information back into our current form. I imagine it kind of like a, a spiral that just keeps crossing over itself and over itself and never really has a, a definitive ending. Uh-huh. That, that's my, but, my understanding of time. Uh-huh. Yes, sure I, yes it, is, it is a valid perspective, yes. Um, what I wanted to point out is when I speak to Illustrating what you said, when I speak to the people, um, you know, four dimension or seven dimension, basically, that's most most of my conversations are with the four dimension, and there were, there were a few conversations with um, human spirits which are now in the seven dimension, the world of dead of discarnate spirits. So they say that um, they the reason they it's designed for them this way is that they also have a learning experience. Basically, it is, it is for them, they also don't know the future. They also play that game, uh, game of uh, learning. So the learning experience happens not only in 3D, it happens in 4D and it happens in 7D. So our friends in 4D, they also don't know what will happen. They also have free choice and they can influence things and they can see a little bit of our future, maybe a few days ahead, but uh, they're not permitted to know much further because then uh, that learning experience is uh, not as, what's that word, vibrant. That is, would be a nice word. 
And the same thing with the 7D, uh, like so the spirit guides, they know a little bit of our future, but basically they live and they play that game as we play it. Although they're not here in physical, the spirit guides are have huge influence on the events in our lives. And they, again, they don't know the future. They know the, a lot more, but, but the, the future they don't know. They have, uh, they have a lot of other knowledge, but you know they play with the cards they get. They play the game, we, almost our game, although, although they have a lot of influence on random events in our lives. That's their main influence. So when the person dies, the physical body is gone, the etheric body basically, or as Bashar says, the template body is something which is used for the live beings to to attach, it's like a placenta, you know what placenta is? Uh, there is a, a fetus and there is a placenta. Placenta is something which, which is like an egg surrounding the fetus. So when, when the baby is born, the placenta is gone and trashed, but it is a life part which kind of provides all the life environment, life environment for the for the fetus. It's not part of the mother, it's not part of the fetus, it's, it's intermediate temporary uh, device, life thing, I don't know if it's conscious, but it's a life, life organ which is uh, designed to provide the interface between uh, the baby and the mother. So the etheric body for a human is like a placenta for the soul to interface, it is an interface between the soul and, I'm running out of white paper, but basically it is the human, all right, it is a human, and here is the oversoul, and it's branches like it is a tree of life, it branches into multiple branches, and there is a vortex of individual soul which has individual consciousness. It's it's you or I. It's individual person. So you would be different from I. You can be even on a different branch. Okay. So that soul is attached to a physical body through etheric body, which is a placenta in a sense. It is also trashed after the death, but it kind of lives longer. So that's you know, that is interface between the soul and the physical body. And chakras, chakras are playing essential, these are vortexes, essential uh, role in uh, communication between the soul and the physical body. So physical body is gone, placenta is trashed, but the sort of image of you remains, remains with the soul forever. And uh, e that is the soul we communicate with during uh, Hypnotic regressions, hypnotic sessions, or through, through when uh, it is uh, a channeling of spirits or mediumship work, or sometimes they just come and I think it's called a partition. Sometimes they come as uh, physicalized, physicalized ghosts. Yeah, ghosts also. These are would be some of these ghosts have never came to seventh dimension. They can re remain in this template reality in our world, like in third dimension. But but sometimes the souls just visit here, like. The souls which meet people after death, these are kind of the, the souls. And these souls, they can take any, any shape they like, but they choose to appear to humans in a way they, uh, they can be recognizable and welcome. So in most cases, they come and as uh, you know, their best time in their life. They come and people see them. So this welcoming party, the the angel, no, not not angels, more like discarnate humans, the spir human spirits which come and welcome person after death, they would appear uh, in a shape uh, people would recognize them, and uh, typically they wear something with, you know, like white lawn robes. That, that would be typical, but not always. Sometimes they would wear a normal human dress. Um, Let's continue the conversation. There is a lot of other topics. Uh, the study uh, in this seventh dimension, there is a, a lot of study happening, and uh, they take some sort of they, there are some sort of classes, and most uh, they have collective uh, lessons and they have individual homework. 
So in collective lessons, basically, they discuss the experiences of past lives. And in uh, homework, they replace the scenarios. So yes, the opportunities in this 3D life and this physical experience are lost. But there in 7D, they can replay the same scenario. And that's what they are supposed to do. That's what they do. They take all the opportunities which I missed here and replay them there. And again, it's not automatic. It is their choice. It's their conscious, conscious choosing, free will. There is which scenarios to replay and to be part of which of the scenarios. I invite your uh, questions and comments. No, I get it. The lady goes first. <laughs> I just want to ask you a question. What do you mean when we are here if we miss some opportunities? Oh. Uh, what, what kind I of wanted my mother to visit. I wanted my mother to visit America. When she died, she never visited America. So I, I missed the opportunity to have her experience my life here, which is completely different, very different from my life there. Is That's that really? Yeah, that's opportunity. Is this really um, the most important opportunity in your life that you really, 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 really want that to happen? At the moment, it was uh, a big part of what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So, and then uh, we'll get to play that um, or see that in the seventh dimension? Is yes. that what you're saying? Yes, yes. And you're gonna be you. You will be part of it too. I will decide Just later. See that? Mm. I will decide later. I don't know. Uh, okay. I, there is a lot of opportunities. Like say, you know, when my uh, hybrid child Peter uh, was conceived, my wife and and I were very happy, and we hoped that he will be born here. But it will be taken up there, and he uh, grew up. He's now about. Uh, whatever, 17 years old up there. And I never met him, so that opportunity is also lost. I mean, having a baby, he already grew up. I can't, I cannot hold him as a baby. He would be a big man when I meet him. So that's another lost opportunity. I guess that was a very profound uh, recent opportunity that, what, that was lost, and uh, I felt sorry for that as well. No, it's not a death, but uh, he was gone from here, from, from this reality. Max, if I may, yes. I have a uh, suggestion. Um, you keep saying that you've lost this opportunity. Yes. Perhaps, perhaps where we are multidimensional beings ourselves, you can tap into the, the, um, the meeting between yourself and your, your hybrid child and create that memory, as it were. Ah, create. Yes, I understand. Where you are, yes, where, yes, you are yes. a, where you are a stem of of a, a larger oversoul, surely yes. you can connect into <clears throat> one of your, your other aspects of self that is taking care of your hybrid child up on the the colony or wherever wherever he is. Because in my in my understanding it would be an aspect of yourself that is looking after your hybrid child, wouldn't it be? I I hear what you're saying. It is a possibility. Yes. Hmm. I was just thinking when you're talking that um, <clears throat> we always like to refer to ourselves as a branch off of our over soul. The idea of ascension is to become your highest self, which is the main focal point of your entire over soul. I hear you. So I kind of think we're looking at it one-sidedly. I hear Sometimes you. Sometimes you need to think that you are actually your oversoul in all these extraterrestrials that you speak to, all the angels, all the ghost spirits are connected to you, but they are branches of you. You're not a branch of all that is. All that is is branching from you. That's a nice point. I accept it. Awesome. That's all. I wanted to bring up uh, something I learned from dogs. 
uh, that was another experience. Oh, no. mm, it wasn't that profound, but it was interesting. So we have. We have hey, ah, uh, Curly, you wanted to say something. Curly, you wanted to say something. Curly, I'll mute you. I think. Okay, okay, thank you for muting. Uh, Steve, you wanted to say something, uh, right? No, sorry, I was uh, interrupted. The, the oh, okay. my computer is not working. Sorry, I'm listening. Okay. Um, Steve, are you? You wanted to say something. Uh, uh just a suggestion. Uh, has anybody seen the new movie that came out called Edge of Tomorrow? It's, no. Uh, I yeah, just, I've seen it. Yeah, it brings it brings real clarity about the importance of your single soul fragment of your oversoul because you have multiple soul fragments that are living simultaneously that are having their own experiences and their own lessons. Now, in this life, as a fractal of your oversoul. You have you have your experiences and your your lessons that you set up, and so some things that you uh, some opportunities that you really want to achieve and happen uh, sometimes is not set up in this experience because of reasons because of 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 this single pathway that you're taking. But you're but as soon as you think of so, something like hey uh, like maybe being doing something else that you might have missed. There's another soul fragment that's living that, that is experiencing that. And once we're able to tap into that, once we raise our vibration high enough, we'll be able to tap into all of them soul fragments. So therefore, you can connect and go to that other, uh, say, in a sense, missed opportunity in this fragment of your soul. But it all, it, it, it's your over soul and your higher self will always keep creating soul fragments of opportunities and experiences that you say you didn't uh, experience in this fragment, in this soul fragment. So therefore, you're really not missing out anything. It's just in our perceptions now, we're we're limited. But that's what we're do what we're doing. We're transforming into becoming fully conscious, crystalline bodies where we're able to uh, uh, see all where we can lay the film strip on, on the on the table and and go to any one of them so fragments we want to where we can see the whole projection instead of just seeing one piece of the film so in in, in my sense uh, you're really not missing on, in, in nothing life is is now uh, you you choose your lessons and experiences and and when you when we get to that higher state you'll be able to to do uh, all of them Opportunities that you wish to do in this life, it, it will come. It, that's what's happening when we when we become fully conscious, have all of our chakras open, have all of our senses open, have all of our abilities open, and where we can we can do miraculous like we can do miraculous things, man. It, it, we, that's what we are doing right now. I have a question. Yes. Can you still do this uh, while you are in the physical body? Uh, seems like we have such a short time here and such a long task. There's no achieve. time. Everything is here and now. Keep reminding yourself of that every moment you can. There's no short or long time on this world. It is just every day you wake up and you're telling yourself a new story. Your whole life is memories, doesn't mean it's not real, but understand that it's all happening right now, and if you prefer something else, then you have to make the changes within your own belief structures. Mm. In One fact, thing. time speeds up yeah. when you enjoy yourself and you're doing what you love, and time seems to slow down when you're bored, and um, so... It's quite an illusion how that plays a trick on you. Yeah, it's kind of the more you follow your excitement, the faster time goes by, and then you actually start healing and growing younger. So if you really want to follow your excitement, you're actually going to stick around longer. So if your, your preference is to leave Earth, then don't follow your excitement just to be depressed. That's a good idea. <laughs> One thing I learned today in that relation was uh, I was hearing 
listening to Treb's channel in a private session, uh, and there um, he said that it is our third chakra, the solar plexus chakra, which is responsible for time. And when it is strong, you are in peace with uh, this third dimensional time. And when it's kind of repressed, then you become out of sync with time and get in all sort of trouble. You know, for me, it was the whole life I had real, real trouble getting on the uh, uh, to the train when when you know, when when it's supposed to be. Especially if it was a daily train, I was always like one minute left late, and the train would be would be leaving, and I would be like late to something important. So for me, time is, is quite real, and now I have a nice uh, Google Calendar, which reminds me, and, and a phone which has uh, all this, it has a pre-programmed time there, uh, which, uh, like, you know, wake up, uh, wake up kids, uh, now time to send a kid to, to bus, now the time to send a second kid to bus, and blah, blah, blah. So I'm in much more peace with time, and this webinar is also timed, so, so this is, um, I'm in much more peace. I understand it is illusion, but it is... A powerful the illusion. The excitement at that moment was to make that train. There's nothing that could have stopped you from getting it. I understand. Yes, it's a very powerful illusion, and uh, I guess that's the nature of 3D experience to master that time thing. And uh, to, obviously, you can control time in strange ways, but um, you know, successful people control it in a very successful way, and unsuccessful people control it in uh, another way around, just to get to get harmed by it. So when I speak to my third dimension, uh, fourth dimensional friends, like Lakesh, Dizdu, Takur, and others, I ask them, uh, especially it was interesting, you know, Takur and Dizdu was very profound. I said, from your fourth dimension, mm, how many timelines do you look at the same, you know, at this moment? Uh, how many timelines do you look like? Look, at how many timelines do you look in our third dimension? And he said, I think for Dizdu it was about seven, and for Takur it was about five. And I asked, you know, in which of these timelines you communicate to me? And he said, only in one timeline I communicate with you. And I said, in all timelines, am I communicating, you know, with uh, other extraterrestrials? And it looks like only in this timeline I'm doing that. In all other timelines I'm doing something else. And other than that, you know, they're not allowed to just divulge, just close what we are doing in another timeline. So it's all that's, like tab taboo. That's what we call parallel realities. You yeah. know, the choices, exactly. Yeah, because if we started talking about all our our parallel versions of ourselves on the planet, then we could start being held responsible for their actions. Just like on Jet Li, the one. Exactly, but the thing is, that's going to be the future. That's why crime will end, because everyone will realize that they're committing crimes against their own selves. Why they... That's, that's, that's why it's always the most important thing is love thyself, yeah. first and foremost. Well, first and foremost, definitely. Uh, creation of the universe. Uh, Mary, you brought up that idea that death is, is essential. Uh, that it is given here for a purpose. And most profound... Uh, the reading I had about that was by Robert Shapir, where he spoke to an entity which was responsible for designing and maintaining the lifespan on different planets. So that was their responsibility. And it was a very enlightened and loving being. But, you know, their, their responsibility is to make sure the species lives as long as they choose to. So human collective chose that at this time of time, at this period of now, uh, we live so many years. And somebody like, you know, dwarfs or gnomes or, or fairies or someone like that kind of service energies, they are making sure that we do that, we live so much longer and not, not much longer. And again, the human collective chose to have the experience of age and cancer and other things which are the cause of death, obesity in uh, civilized uh, technological countries and uh, hunger in non-technological countries. So for me, it was 
quite profound to understand that it was a choice. That even the way of death, even the, the length of life is, is a choice. Another, another profound understanding for me was to imagine how people die. What do they think when they die? And in the movies, we see mostly the death in action, death of violence, which is not exactly reflective of what, how it happens in real reality. Uh, there is also an image of uh, an elderly person dying and surrounded by family, loving family, and holding the hand of something and saying something profound. It's, on my experience also, it's not very typical. What, I, what the deaths I experienced or observed, the people before death, they didn't have something profound to say, and they weren't surrounded much by, by family because Really, family, you know, they can't be there all the time. And uh, unfortunately, many people die in medical institutions, and they might have one or two family members and one or two nurses around. But you know, that is the the moment of death is very trivial. Is very trivial. So, and some some people die at homes, but again, the moment of death is very trivial. Typically, in normal life. Whatever is to be said is already said, and it is already said a long time ago, and nothing new comes out. Another profound thing is that people are usually, unfortunately, remembered in the way they died, not in the way they lived. And I think that is unfortunate and shouldn't be like that. Usually death is not very pretty, not very beautiful. So. Why would you remember the old person unhappy dying in a sick from sickness and not the happy person uh, in the highest of his life? <laughs> so, so that is a more the thing I'm preaching mostly, especially during funerals and uh, meetings. Uh, I, how they call it? Gatherings I after guess, the funerals. I guess I was quite lucky, Max. Uh, Even on my father's deathbed, he he gave us a joke on our, on his deathbed. Oh. So it was, it was a very, very high vibration in the room when he left. Nice. Can you share that or you shouldn't? It was two weeks ago this week. Uh, two years ago this week. So it's, um, yeah, it's a little bit. The joke, you, you, you shouldn't share, right? I mean, just say no, it would be easier. No, not oh, the moment. Fine, 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 fine. So uh, the profound understanding was, uh, there was a book. Mm, a fiction book, a uh, historical fiction about uh, King David, and he was dying. And th there was a what he was thinking while dying. And you would think that a famous king, you know, very powerful king, would think something important when he's dying. And his thinking was. And it rings true, that, you know, that's so profound because it, I think it feels true that he was just cold, lonely, and tired, and that's why he died. He was laying on the bed, and even his wives weren't entertaining him, he he, and he, they weren't warm enough, and, you know, he wanted to be left alone, and he just wanted to go because he was tired. He was cold, and with this thinking that, you know, I better go. He he left. There was nothing profound there, but that understanding of you know how normally people die. I think it was. It's like going to sleep. You know, when you go to sleep, you say sometimes I just tired. How about I just sleep? And I think that's how most of the people die these days, just from being tired to leave. I have something uh, interesting, if I could share. It's a slightly off topic, but it's All important right. about life. It's mm -hmm. not really a topic, it's just off the topic that you were specifically on. Um, anyway, my daughter was in and out and I couldn't listen 100%, but there were so many profound subjects that were touched upon that each within themselves would need uh, their own time. But one thing um, Reverend Moon taught us about, uh, an interesting concept to think about is this. When we're in the mother's room, we're, we're breathing through the water. When we're on the earth, we're breathing through oxygen. 
So what do we breathe in the spirit world? I, I, I'm asking you. I know the answer, but I'm asking. What do we breathe in the spirit world when, after we go to the next level? <laughs> what, well, Brian, I'll, I'll ask you since I'll, I'll start to, the, to my left. Are you implying that we breathe ice? <laughs> no. I'll, tr I'll try to make a guess at it. I feel like that's uh, where you were going. You mean I want to say we, we breathe light. <laughs> that's that's part of it. What Nick? That's what that resonates well. Light. Uh, I would say emotions of the uh, 3D beings maybe are part of the breathing. Yeah. And Nick, did you want to say something? Because I couldn't hear it. No. Okay. Or you're asking uh, what we eat when, or what we breathe is the same thing as saying what we eat. Well, of what course. we like in yeah, breathe. Well, I'm thinking more breathing because in the we eat food, but we breathe oxygen, so both are necessary nutrients. But uh, okay, so I'll just say that I'll tell you that um, what we breathe is love, is God's love, the Creator's love. Yes, and, and that comes from where? Comes from that the Creator. Comes from <laughs> physical beings. Okay. Well, I agree. To bask in our energy, they just want it to be more of a unconditional, positive, loving energy, rather than a depressed, more, you know, morbid existence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I so agree. they will appear as haunted or a ghost or a goblin or something scary to a person who has issues inside of themselves. Right. No dangerous or evil spirits. Okay. That's another subject. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 but what I wanted to say was this, that uh, it's, it's really important for, well, when I was younger, uh, I, I often had experiences when I was sleeping that I couldn't breathe anymore, and I would have to force myself awake to breathe. And as I got as I got closer to to God, and I don't mean this in a religious way, I mean it like it just in a natural in a natural conscious way of connecting to universal love or whatever. But uh, the closer I got to that kind of relationship, the less though that kind of this kind of breathing um, crisis crisis has happened. So I just want to pass that along. That if we, the more we open our heart to fourth dimensional energy and love, and whatever it means to everybody, and whoever that means included in your life, whether extra or terrestrial, whatever, um, when we when we lose our physical bodies, then we will be able to first of all move in in many directions and move higher. Because you know, when you get to the higher levels of spirit, where your spirit isn't matching it. You can't stay there. It's like going up to a very high mountain. You just can't breathe the air. So, um, yeah. So for me, that's one goal of, of, of um, growing spiritually is to be able to move in many different realms and be able to breathe in that love. Well, the idea is that you can do it's, that now, you know, right? Well, yeah, I need to do it now. Otherwise, I won't be able to do it later. So, so I mean, yeah. Just well, you're saying a part of my life now. things when you're in spirit. Well, if I learn how to open myself up to to love and put dimensional energy and live it, you're all when I lose my about all existence. If you exist, you're already completely connected, completely open. It's just a matter of perceiving that. Perhaps I don't perceive yes, it. Uh, Sophia, uh, um, one thing. Um, I think yeah. we're we're trying to. Um, when you say open yourself up to fourth dimensional energy, um, from my understanding is that it was released as a giant kind of, almost like a wave that got shot straight into into our reality. So it's already here, um, and it's more of a case of if you perceive yourself as receiving fourth dimensional energy, mm -hmm. then you already are. But by saying that you you are trying to open yourself up, you're you're it's almost like putting a block in front of it. If, if that makes sense. Okay, thank um, you. I'm not, I'm not I'm not trying to I'm not trying to 
kind of no no don't worry just don't ever don't, Dan, uh, Dan don't ever uh, you never need to qualify what you're saying or or uh, in any way that's fine just say whatever you guys say it's all cool I'm all cool with it uh, it's it's a matter of semantics I, I think I'm used to old paradigm semantics and that's the only thing but you're right yeah I tend to I'm very hot on myself and I tend to block um, block what's already there you're right and Nick is right but anyway I didn't really want to get into yeah well maybe I did want to get into it it wasn't really about me specifically but I think a lot of us do that we block yeah yes it's um it's something about the English language as well that I've, I've noticed is that we it's a very kind of negating language it it's it's full of ifs buts maybes there's yeah. no kind of, if you really want it to be definitive then you have to kind of state it's definitive instead of going uh, kind of that's that's one of the funniest things about the English language and yeah. it's the only one that I I consciously know all about as well so it's it's yeah. funny that I kind of I, I see a bit more of a connection to the the light languages because they're more kind of they just flow, they just come out and you get hit with the energy instead of kind of um in and ah and around the energy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, once, um, speaking about the English language, once Bashar invited another Sasani to uh, speak through, through Daryl, so that Sasani came and first thing he said was, what do you want? And it sounded very rude but, you know, that's exactly what you're supposed to, to say, you know. He invited the questions and it was the simple way he translated was what do you want, right? But English language makes it much more sophisticated. What would you like to ask or be so kind and so on? That's like German. <laughs> German's <laughs> like that. So, I was just say, really. <laughs> yeah, so, I, yeah. so Russian culture is um, is uh, very pure, I mean traditional old Russian culture is very pure that death was a taboo subject in, in that culture and when we were exposed to English culture it was a complete nightmare for us like English culture is all obsessed with death it's uh, nursery rhymes you can imagine it's all about death and all possible you know weird uh, perversions of death I guess nursery rhymes and when you th read about poetry I mean all good English poets, you know, most of them are writing about de death. It's like the main subject of the of the of the literature there. <laughs> American would be quite different, you know. Again, Morrison, what's his name? Jim Morrison. Yeah, Jim Morrison was all obsessed with that, right? Mm. What Woody, if Allen, Woody Allen yeah. also. What if after every time you die, you're just born instantly on another planet, and then when you die there? You're born onto another one until you just keep doing a series around the whole galaxy. I think some 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 of the entities do that, but not typical humans. We're kind of stuck here. Yeah, I think um, interesting how when you're born on a planet, you can tap into the soul of that specific planet mm -hmm. and experience all that is just on that planet alone and then the idea is once you do that in your mind because once you realize that there's only one mind that it's actually very simple to connect to that but then you actually go back and want to forget it again in order to experience things again even if you're in the same body what I've heard is people try to kill themselves but I died twice in this life and I'm still here. I didn't kill myself, but basically there's no accidents. What, what I've heard to expand on that is that we say, for example, we come to this planet, say, you know, we come to this planet, raise the vibration of this planet, ourselves and Gaia and everything, and as we're the level uh, going up in dimensions to a certain level, then our, we move on to another planet, inhabit that, and do the same thing over and over. Yeah, I mean, I know that I did, I lived a life on, uh, I don't know, a planet. I was a blue Octarian, or not Octarian. Wow, that came out. Uh -huh. I guess I was an Octarian too. Anyway, <laughs> um, I was saying a blue Pleiadian. 
and that still doesn't narrow it down for me very much. The only thing I picture as that, with how it's described, is basically like the people, the Navi, <laughs> basically. Um, but I, you know, was the Rook Makdao, the rider of the last shadow in that movie. You know, I so led revol revolution in a positive direction, but I came with the enemy originally. That's what we're, we're. That's how our remember. We're remembering soul memory. We tap into that. So yes, as individual as individuality, we're, we're tapping into that. But yes, we we come here. We take physical form. We we have a, a what you call the bubble of biology, and we you know we're we're we're, we're experiencing everything that we wanted. That was the whole thing of this life and other on other planets was to experience as much as you can as you evolve. Then you go to other planets. And then, but the memory is always there, the soul memory. So that's what's our past life memories. Those are soul essence, soul memories. Yes. What, what, what would you call it if someone's higher self decided to stay for good and they had a different name? How would people react to that on this planet? What do you mean stay for I'm good? Sure. You mean incarnate and remain incarnated? Sort of, no. Um, the idea of being born again. That you die and then you're reborn as a new person. Is that what we do? Yes, but what if you took that a step further? Which, which way? Like you literally were an actual different person. I don't understand the question. That your memories of that when you wake up are of this life, the memories of this body, and of another. Your past oh, lives... Are, about walk -ins. Your walk-ins or your past lives are intermixing. You, you're very open, so you're remembering all at once and pulling in a lot of your past lives. But so what if the higher self, personality, that version of it, that individual version of it, one of the parallel versions of myself decided to if I allowed them to stay kind of like what happened yesterday your body. yes I know what you're saying um, like, when, when I speak to extraterrestrials I ask them you know how much do you remember of your past lives and at which point do you remember so typically like Yael, please, uh, Yael and a uh, few others said that uh, they remember a little bit but around the age of three they allowed to remember almost everything I mean, There's that's artificial, uh, artificial forgetting which is chosen by human collective, you know, how much we're allowed to remember. But Nick, some so people remember a lot. Nick, so you're saying, if, if I hear you correctly, you're saying that your memory, what if you let go and have that other me remembrance of that life, like they took over your body in a way? Perhaps. Mm -hmm. I understand a little bit. There are some it people. Demon. It was always a dream and out of love for what is best for all parties involved. And not just the two beings, but the ones they affect on the outside of themselves. Well, do you anyway, want that to happen? Have the movie The Skeleton Key? I've There's heard of that. They, uh, these people, they were originally slaves and they learned voodoo and eventually they just um, took over, they, they switched their consciousness into the bodies of their owner's kids. And then they were them and then they kept living and then every time they would get old they would just do it again to younger bodies. So they kept living. And then those per people's consciousness was shifted into their old bodies. That That's fascinating. Maybe that's a new where we're headed, where we can be able to really do that. So yes. the only scary There's thing no is... no longer Enoch on the colonies. Right. The only scary thing is, I guess, for humanity or for us, you know, perceiving that, seeing that, is that... If you feel comfortable 
but just let those around you, your your mom and your family and your you know your kids, let them understand that somehow. Explain that to them because that's going to be a shocker for them if you did that, if you chose that. Uh, once I once I was um, okay. Mm -hmm. You can do. I will interrupt you later. Do you want to say something? Uh, no. Uh, All right. I'm good. W once I was uh, speaking to a Syrian lady. Um, it was in my early first one of the first communications, and I asked you know, why my scientific uh, research is not going any anywhere. I, like I have so many good ideas, and it looks like all of that is blocked. And her answer was, uh, I, I was kind of working on DNA and light experiments and trying to DNA sound and light and, and effects of sound and light on DNA. And uh, her answer was that you will be working on that in the future, in a future life. And <laughs> you will be working on that not as a incarnated individual, but as a, no. You work in, we'll be working on that on, as an architect of, of a species. So basically, right now what Nico you're saying is, how about we design a new species, a new experience? And, and some of us basically in other incarnations, in other um, manifestations are doing just that, designing the new species uh, from scratch, basically knowing what we got from different past lives. So right now, the Earth experience is an extreme in many ways and one of the ways it is you're really forced you're really the culture and the genetics and the limitations of the veil make you believe you're here alone and that is for real and uh, it's up to you to survive and uh, and the main fear of in your life is death and all you do is balancing and playing to delay the death that is the experience of a 3d 3d human and we're still here. If you forget to eat, or if you uh, are not careful driving, or if you close to, to come too close to a cliff, you you can easily die. So you you still have all these reflexes and um, art of surviving. And you know, if anything happens, you would put all your energy into surviving. Now, uh, many other species they have, uh, or cultures, they have much more relaxed and much more spiritual conditions, especially 4D, 4D ones. They have uh, all sorts of um, guidance. They can speak to their spirit guides. They can speak to their higher selves. They can speak to higher selves of other people. They um, have a perception what will happen next. They have some sort of... of ability to avoid um, unnecessary death of the physical body like Yael, they can just disappear and reappear some, somewhere else. So death for them is is uh, not something to be afraid of. And if they die, they can easily incarnate again and uh, they will remember their past life at large. So it's only the, the body that will change, but not the life. Imagine. So, yes. And you know what the beauty of it is? Mm -hmm is that if everybody realized that our soul is eternal and and that death, then that's what we're moving out of. We done did all the experiences on this earth of, of experience and death. We're moving to where we're transforming our body to where there is no death. You choose when you die. Once you become a crystalline body, and then you, then you can transform into the bo diamond body. Crystalline, then diamond. And then, uh, and then there's no diseases. Once you vibrate that high, uh, when you have all that light capacity in you, there's no more diseases, no more death, because you vibrate at such a high rate that the they, 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 experiences are for this dimension and for this denseness and for this duality. That's what we're moving into, that death, if you ascend and you raise your consciousness and your vibration, it's a choice. You choose when you want to die. Um, yeah, I concur. Many species come to Earth um, just to experience a short time of uh, living on Earth. Let's say just like a miscarriage or a, or a very young death. That's all that entity wanted to experience of being on Earth. Sometimes I yes, feel yes, that yes. an entity will come and do that 
in order to gain a physical bridge to the planet. So they can remain here on spirit and do more than they would have been able to as a physical body. That is an important point as well. Yes. Uh, first point was that, uh, you know, I, I had that illustration. Someone said, uh, I think it was Bashar's session, when someone said that I had miscarriage and, you know, there was a, a fetus and it was gone. And Bashar said, you know, that was, that was their choice. Uh, Bashar often says that even now people choose, people, you know, People cannot die without choosing that. Basically, higher self chooses when to die. It's, it's the choice of the higher self when to end the life. And um, so somebody said that their fetus, um, you know, that, that was a miscarriage, and he said, you know, that entity chose that j just to experience. They can't, they they won't used to the life on Earth, and that's maximum what they could, uh, what it were, tolerate of of uh, endure of of the Earth life is just to be physically in in the womb, and they couldn't even tolerate that. And I meet sometimes uh, star seeds who are completely not suitable for the life here. They are, they are, they feel that you know, sometimes they've been very healthy, very healthy and reasonably successful, and it just you know the nature of the reality makes them very unhappy because they, it's their first incarnation. They're given healthy body, nice uh, environment so they can prosper, but you know, just the nature of reality for them is very, very unfamiliar and unfriendly. And another point which Nick said was that uh, it's like a short incarnation as a means of travel. Say you're in seventh dimension and you want to, to remain as a spirit on that planet, you incarnate there briefly, and but then the, you travel, you basically you, you remain around that planet and uh, as a spirit and uh, in, uh, learn this way. I met, uh, I read about few things like there, like a gray, a Zeta gray, uh, mm, now incar is incarnated as Sunny Seta, Commander Sunny Seta, her interviews on YouTube. Uh, he crushed, due to his curiosity, he crushed his ship and uh, uh, he didn't follow the orders, and uh, he and several other members died. And as a punishment, he was forced to incarnate here on Earth. And sh uh, as a Sunny said, and she is very unhappy about the life. But but I mean, you speak to a Gray who remembers a lot about their Gray existence as a, as a Gray. So that is very that's, interesting. Max, yes. that's interesting that you say that because I've always found that fascinating. Like if uh, extraterrestrial, you know, when they come here to this planet and visit this planet say that their ship crashes, you know, their body and they die, yeah, does, do, do they reincarnate here on Earth or do it back on their planet? So, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, sometimes they do incarnate here. Uh, I have met, I think, maybe a couple more instances of people who remember the extraterrestrial life and remember the crash and then they describe what happened there and then basically they have all the remembrance and then here's, they live now here. Here's another interesting thing. What if one of us was physically taking on the taken on the ship on a ship and brought to say era and if we passed away and died would we reincarnate on era i think we always have a choice but because we have con a fresh connection we might have a more choice you know where to incarnate it's interesting but before you incarnate there is a long p process of uh, of digesting whatever li the past life you you did before you jump yeah, there's yeah, something come. that I yeah, just I agree really with karma. Thinking about that an era, something, something is coming, um, because I had, I had an existence on era, as Zach, as a name Zach. I don't know how it happened, but I don't understand. He's not a good person. Is it a walk-in, Nick? What? Like a walk-in? Like his spirit switches with yours, or like the, you know what I mean? I had at least seven dreams about him throughout my life doing terrible things. Okay. It was on ERA. A lot of the places in ERA are very similar to the places on Earth, like schools and, and, and some cities. 
and but their technology is higher than ours because they didn't destroy the Earth, their their planet. They could call you could call it Earth when you're on an era if you want. It's the same cut from the same stone if you know what I'm saying. Yes. Um. But I was a star seed on this planet and on that one. On that planet, I did my best, but I... Okay, so in a way, I lived a life on Era and then Terra, and then when they died, they switched places in order to bring the planets together. That was human that lived on Era, could not understand the unconditional love of the planet and caused great destruction. In this world, it is painful for me to see such destruction and it is going to cause me to become stronger and bring this world together also. If I have done it before, I can do it again. Back into balance. But Zach had died a few months ago. Ah. In our time. He was not, uh, I don't know, he was raised by parents on Earth, on our Earth, that were uh, abusive and, 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 and drug addicts, mostly pills and alcohol. And we switched places when we were three. He moved there and I moved here. Yes. So I'm actually Aaron, not Taryn. So you're actually taking on his personality then? And he's taking on yours? Well, I took his body and he took mine. Okay. But you can tap into his personality anytime. <clears throat> it's just as valid as any other. Right. I prefer not to. Right. I understand. Thank you that for that. I don't know, and that memory just came back, so thank you. Now I know why I felt so different since that long ago. Interesting. Switching uh, back to the idea of uh, death and incarnations, and following the idea of uh, time between the incarnations, uh, at some point I just realized I don't know how true it is, but uh, if a person dies at that moment, and it seems too soon for us, one of the reasons that might have be happening because an opportunity arised for a person to incarnate soon as someone else. Say there are two parents who are good genetically and uh, spiritually and there is an opportunity for that person to be born again why that spirit would choose to live longer as an old man when uh, there is an opportunity to incarnate as a, as, a, as a new person so maybe one of the reasons for death would be would be just an opportunity to be born again in a favorable condition there's also work to do in the spirit world <laughs> yes yes um, yes so oh, maybe they go there because they can do more in the spirit world than on the earth, perhaps as well. Uh, on the right side, I'm posting some books uh, by Anthony Borgia. Anthony Borgia was a medium. I'm not sure if he's still alive, but he channeled uh, a monsignor in the Catholic Church in, from the spirit world, who was supposed to reform this Catholic Church by letting them understand what is happening in the spiritual world about life and life after death and things like that because uh, this Monsignor was getting visions for many years while he was a priest or high up in the Catholic Church but he was too afraid to do it because he was going to be ostracized or whatever so he was to talk about opportunities Max that he missed so uh, he passes into the spirit world and then he asks for a chance to still try to reform the Catholic Church understanding of spirit and life and death um, through this medium called Anthony Borgia. 
So there are three books he wrote all about death, uh, what happens before death, and I'm, the, I'm talking now about the spiritual world realms, and um, so there's lots going on there as well. <laughs> I get confused between the spirit world realms and then the ET realms because of the That's ETs because it's all. all one realm. There's a natural mystic flowing through the air. But they talk about it as two separate realms, Nick. You know, like Jakir said you have to so somebody but said but you have to you talk realm. about your waking state and your dream state as two different realms when they're the same reality. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Um, no, I was, I was trying to interrupt her. No, it's okay. I just, uh, <laughs> I may be too old for some of your concepts. No, it's not that. It's just, I just, I just keep doing it so you keep, I, I'm trying to, um, I'm not trying. All I'm doing, because when I do that, I, I just, I just like to recalibrate so you guys have a more simple you don't have to think of it as two different worlds. They're right here with us. You have an uh, uh, you have someone in the room with you, right now. A aunt. Okay. Yeah, I'm sure I do. They're always with us. Yeah. And when you think about them, they show up right away. Yeah. So the idea is not to worry about what happens when we go. The idea is how do we bring this as one world together. And then no one dies. Yeah. Because I, I no think, yeah. Thank you. No, I, I really enjoy what you say. Even though I, I try to, I, I'm the I type. I just want to say something. I, I have to. Oh, oh, just one sec, real quick. Mary, can I just finish go ahead, my? Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I get stuck in trying to visualize things, and if I can't visualize it, I, I have trouble with it. But what I want to say is that there are a lot of people listening who also can't grasp these really interlocking concepts so I don't know if it's a good idea for them to start maybe with even that there is a spirit world and if they can't embrace the ET world yet and you know understand that at first do you know what I mean not everybody can embrace the concept that it's all one yeah the same the idea is that you know hell and heaven are just perspectives of this life some people think of it like that because if this is all there is, this is all that is, yeah. then all you need to focus on right now, and the more you focus on what will be when you have been trained to believe non-existence occurs, which is obviously a lie, because mm -hmm. there's no such thing as non-existence. So if you understand that there's no such thing as non-existence and everything is one thing, then you'll understand the spirit realm and the physical realm are one in the same. The spirits are just as much physical as mm -hmm. these bodies are spirit. Right. They just have a different vibration. Yeah, all. Just vibrating right. faster, slower, more like we are um, vibrating into a pile of flesh and bones and they're vibrating into vapor and temperature. Yeah. You can yeah. touch them and then if you, if you get closer to them, they can lower their density easier because they only take their cue from us. We are the ground team even mm -hmm. for the spirit world. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. why I understand that. They can show themselves in pictures and oh, wait, uh, Mary wants to have seen them and seen their ancestors and shook hands with angels and saw them walk right through a wall right after and nobody else saw it. Yeah. You know, they oh, can I'm sorry, Mary just you believing that it's real, not not trying to believe, but to know. Mm -hmm. I can't even read anymore because it's too many words to describe the same thing most of the time. A whole book about one thing is fine, but I spent my whole life reading books. <laughs> I can pick up a book and I understand the whole thing. That's I don't awesome. even, I just read the back of it and a couple pages or open it to a random thing. It's like, oh yeah, I, I, I knew that when I was four. Good. Mm -hmm. I know this book. Awesome. <laughs> but it's not like I believe I know everything, but the state of knowingness is the most powerful state there is. Yeah. They say, say it with confidence and no one will know the difference. Mm -hmm. I don't tend to believe that is true. I'd say if you know it with confidence, there is no difference between that and what others would perceive as the truth. 
Yeah. Oh, so, it's well, great in my eyes, excitement, so it must be true. On the topic. Topic. Okay, Ma Mary, Max, Mary wanted to say something, and oh, I asked her to wait until I was done. Yes. Go ahead, Mary. Hello? Yeah. Um, okay. I, just, I just wanted to say that uh, since our experiences uh, in this life, in the physical body, everybody's experience is different. So is uh, when we go to the spirit uh, realm, their ex everybody's experience out there is different too. So if, if somebody is writing um, his experiences from spirit realm, that's his experience. So I am. I used to read a lot of books, you know, about uh, near-death experiences and past, uh, and you know, a lot of books about spirituality. I don't read them anymore because, you know, because of the reason I just said. Because you know, my exper their experience is their experience. It's a good knowledge, you know. It's good that you know you can gain more knowledge, but it's not necessarily my experience. Because I can answer for for that, Mary. It's because those books that are written, it's mostly in the eyes of, of the beholder. So it's through their eyes. You're exactly right. Their experiences, their emotions, they put their essence into that book. So what we're reading is just from their perspective. And take what you need and leave the rest behind until it comes back. Yes, I agree. There is a choice. There is a, a choice. How uh, what we focus on, what uh, uh, the reality, especially the higher realities, will will change, uh, will change accordingly. So for Nick, uh, there is no difference between seventh dimension and third dimension. It's all the same. So it's his choice. For for me, I uh, I can kind of create my own reality, my own understanding of higher dimensions, which is. You know, again, it's a very simplified version. I mean, we can argue how it is, but you know, when when you get there, you discover that he was right and I was right, and uh, all all kind of just looking at from different angles at the same thing. Uh, I I pose these questions to you know beings from seven and four dimension, and for them there is a difference. For them there is a clear clear difference, and also they say that there is a veil separating different dimensions and there is a lot about uh, science about that uh, I mean science um, accounts about that um, well, a very complex very beautiful architecture and there is that channel it's actually multiple channels called Distani farm are you familiar with Distani farm no no uh, Google Distani D E S T and I, D E S T E N I. Um, uh, so there, there is a. Uh, it, it's it's a very dark uh, branch of light workers, but they're very interesting. So they have a, their own philosophy. They are based in South Africa, and kids from uh, from all around the world kind of ended up there, you know, teenagers, and and they channel. And their philosophy is that even our souls are trapped, and you know here we have that trapped reality where in we are we are in the prison and we reincarnate. We are forced to reincarnate, and we cannot escape the cycle. Now, when we uh, die, we get into a seventh dimension, and also that we are trapped there. So when I was speaking, I think to some of the higher beings, I, I asked that question: if you know, if it is true that you know. We are trapped even in the seventh dimension, and we are blind, blinded sort of. You know, the veil is blinding. So, are we knowing more? Are we still blinded in the seventh dimension? And the answer was, in a way, yes. The, but it is all there by, de by design. So, dimensions are separated from each other by design to for us to have an experience. If there was no borders, there, there was no separated. Uh, veils, then uh, all will be a mess. It just wouldn't be able to exist. So it's, our existence here. But yes, Max, I'm just expanding on that. It, you're right. It's just the dimensions in between the dimensions. It's just the level of awareness, different levels of awareness, degrees yes. of perception. That's all it is. 
really, yes. You're exactly, exactly right, Max. So yes, the energies flow, and even these whales, they have their own personality, and some of them, some of the channelers channel the whales or the beings responsible for separating the realities and having this whole structure to function. Uh, we have new new uh, new people join us. Do you have anything to say? Hello. Hello. I'm just listening, and it's very interesting. Same here. All right. I, I'm about to wrap up. Uh, uh, Noah, do you have anything to say? No, actually, I'm listening to you, and I agree with everything you say. Actually, about the seven dimensions that Nick was talking, he, he experienced, experiences the same thing with the seventh and the third. For him, it's the same because he integrated those entities with him as one, so he experienced it the same. For us, it's different, isn't it? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. It's, yes, it, it is the angle from which you look at that, right? From certain angle, there is no difference. From certain angle, there is a difference. Like. From this angle, these are two different dimensions, right? And from this angle, it's all the same, something like that. Yeah, different perspective, I suppose. Different perspective. All right. Um, Before you wrap up, could you tell us that the our updates at the human colony up there? What are we doing? Uh, any news from Jim? I missed that part if you had said anything about updates. Yeah. Um, on on how Jim was doing and where he was at and all that. No, are you asking about the colonies or about Jim? Both. I did ask both. I, I came late, so I don't okay. know if you spoke about that. Okay, Jim's father is uh, in intensive care. There is nothing changed. Jim yesterday spoke to his father, so so at least he he didn't miss the opportunity to speak to his father. And his family are sort of, uh, uh, he, he is, uh, they're, they're very nice. And uh, he met his uh, relatives, and uh, they're very nice. That, that is all I know about Jim. He called me yesterday, but uh, the connection was interrupted, so I don't know more. Uh, okay. I could answer that, Max, if you want. So, um, Noha. And the others, Max sends his love and his appreciation for your prayers and support. I mean, Jim. Sorry, did I say Max? Jim sends his love and uh, for your uh, his gratitude for your support and your love, which he feels. And he's visited his dad yesterday, and he's there now. And his dad is stable, but they don't know quite exactly what's wrong with him. So yes, he's staying in nearby the hospital, and yeah, he appreciates your prayers. So thank you. I this there's something I need to say also. When somebody passes away, a close uh, from a, a close friend, if Jim's dad passes away or you know anybody could pass away, we don't know when. So I, I I think my opinion the worst thing to say is um don't feel bad if they're still living and they're going into a transition, because even if they know that right until we know that but still. It's sad. It's sad because you're going to miss the person. Not, I'm not saying everybody would feel sad, would feel the same, but um, do you know what I mean? Sometimes we we talk very high spiritual things, which are true, but in the moment that person just wants a little bit of a hug and and not so many words. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. So. Yeah. That's all I want to say. Max, uh, yes. what about the colony up there? Any news? Any updates? Any feedback? Oh, we recently spoke to James in the colonies, and then we spoke to Douglas. I think it was it was a lot of wow. new information. Make sure you check out Douglas and 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 James. Um, I don't know if if it is easy to find it on YouTube. 
uh, maybe we need to make sure it's uh, in the name of the channel. In the, in, in the past, I, I put all, all the names of the people who spoke, I put them there. But I think for Douglas, I didn't have time to do that. So if any of our helpers can, uh, you know, the ones who have access to the YouTube channel, if you can update the, the titles of the videos, that would help. So what did they say? Um, I think it was a very happy ha happy discovery. The colonies were in pretty good shape. Um, uh, they said the food was wasn't very tasty there. I think that was for me the most uh, most exciting news, because it's it's nice when you have something tangible, something that you can uh, you can uh, associate with. Uh, they said that you know I was there two times, and other people they uh, they. They told how many times they were or how frequent they are. As I understand, look, my, my view of the colonies was that we will be proactively proposing something to extraterrestrials and do diplomatic missions there. But Douglas's view was that uh, it was all run by extraterrestrials, and humans just went along with that. So it was a sort of a collective creation, but the humans weren't any different from extraterrestrials. They came there and became the part of the collective thinking, especially the telepaths. And there was no separation. It's already kind of a happy family uh, where the extraterrestrials are bigger brothers. Apparently, they're higher dimensional. They are more stronger in many ways. So they define the pattern. So that's my understanding. So the, the Arcturians from you know from, from a higher dimension they rule over the thing and um, and everybody else just kind of enjoys enjoys the ride. That is my understanding. Uh, he is a teacher in a class or how do you say uh, a take caretaker for the children in the telepathic colony. Mm. He said that I, I sense I didn't have a chance to ask, but I, I sense that uh, the time you spend in the colony is roughly proportional to the time you are absent here. So if you're there for two weeks, you will be absent here for for hours. I said in the past I said minutes, but apparently according to Douglas, it's hours. Also, his uh, in the past uh, they said that uh, the colonies are in third dimension. And Douglas says that it's largely already, there is so much four dimension happened there, so it's largely four dimensional. So you're going there in four dimension, then you you come down, um, you come down uh, here to the third dimension. And I guess the hardest experience of it all is is to come back and, you know, get used back to the third dimensional life. Uh, c can anybody else remember any other news? Um, yeah, there's uh, many more colonies. I'm still trying to wait. I'm still trying to find out as much as I can about these other colonies before I um, I go too much into it. But they're, most of them are not open to humans yet, as they're currently trying to see where we are in the in the kind of the state of humanity, trying to link up with their contacts within um, within the humanity as well, where we all get. We all get given um, either a group of ET beings or a group of spirit guides, a group of, um, or even just one or two. Um, we can, as we start to remember who they are or be introduced to them, they then uh, start to explain a little bit more about different groups of beings, different races that are around. Um, there are a few that I've been told about, but I still have yet to know anything about a they're kind of an ancient race of Lyran called the Sars. Uh, these were the first beings I ever found out about. Um, and it was the other day when chatting to Roxy that she said that they're actually a group of beings instead of a just a one entity, because I assumed it was his name. Um, and then I met my my Lyran friend Atakir, who is he's slowly catching me up to um, to a point where I can kind of divulge more, more information. Um, it's kind of the this ongoing process of allowing myself to channel him, to become a little bit more in contact with him, um, which 
seems to be going well at the moment. Um, there's one of the Eren colonies is actually orbiting around Saturn within the rings, supposedly. I believe that's E1, which is the main arena colony. Um, there are a few that are above Earth within our, our orbit. Um, some of them are hidden away because they don't want the space station and other other humans to find out about them yet. Um, there are multiple colonies who are trying to open up communication with the humans at this moment as well so that more people can understand certain things that the ET beings are, are trying to get across. Um, as most people in the world are currently in a few different mindsets of, of what ETs are actually wanting to do with this planet, it seems that they're trying to keep a keep as far distance as possible until we make our mind up about what we want them to do. Because in the long run we are we are the decision makers. If we want if we want friendly contact and peace, then that's what we'll get. If we want invasion then they they will they don't really want to do that. And I'm I'm quite happy that they they're choosing that they would rather not do that. But that's also a possibility within a timeline because it's our choice whether or not we allow them to be friendly to us or whether or not we start attacking them as soon as they turn up. So it's all it's all based on how we personally perceive the the contacts and our connection with our extraterrestrial and our subterranean and underwater friends. Because we we're currently trying to communicate with a load of beings who are above us when there's so many beings around us at the moment that we could get so much information about what is going on in our our planet at this very moment from reptilian beings, from the uh, the clairs, from the cloud people. Um, there are also people that live on, um, I'm not sure who they are, but I've been told about a group of beings that they use the, the rainbow as a kind of, like a I'm not going to say, uh, like, the best description of it would be Mario Kart um, with the Rainbow Road. Uh, but that's a really that's a really childish kind of view on it. There's more of more like a civilization living up there as opposed to a race course. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm still trying to trying to find out more about the planet and Agatha at this moment because that's that's one of the the biggest um, holders of information that this planet has got because that's one of the direct links to the Akashic and if we allow ourselves to become one with our home planet then we can become one with each other. You bring up a good point Dan because we're out there searching for life so in the cosmos, yet we know so much little about the life on this planet, yet destroy so much of it carelessly, unthoughtful, with no thought, and yes, we need to certainly help ourselves first before we can ever make contact. Don't, don't, forget, don't forget that we also carry the Akash within our DNA. That's where we have the soul memory. Yes, definitely. And by the way, it's very well hidden. So scientists, our scientists today are going to have a very hard time pinpointing exactly where that's found in the DNA. It'll be many, many years before they can really under, understand all of that. Akashic records are not in third dimension. They are Everywhere. Beyond the, the DNA, the, DNA, the, DNA. The, the RDNA max is all is actually multi-dimensional. Yeah. So DNA is uh, an antenna. Our physical double-stranded DNA is antenna, which connects us to other dimensions. Double helix, but also has a magnetism. It's a magnetic field. Also creates a magnetic field. Yes. Yes. I I personally believe that when we when we are 
raising our vibration and um, we get the feeling that we are vibrating. I, I believe that that's actually us connecting with our DNA and our cell structures and and um, building their, their vibration as well and then we get to feel it in our physical form. That's what I'd like to be in in a um, a symbiotic kind of connection with my cellular structure. Talk to your body. It's yeah. I know it sounds silly, but out loud, your body can heal you. He, he'll hear you. So when you say work with your body, your DNA, you, you remember you have command. So like your thoughts, but actually say it out loud, and your body will heal and respond to that in some way, yeah. shape, or form. Your belief is what holds it back for how soon it will come to you, what you're trying to achieve. It's yeah, like going beyond the belief, and that's the challenge for humans. We're so conditioned. Yeah, it's a kind of getting past the, the idea that if we get an illness, we go straight to the doctors or we go straight to the hospital and get it sorted out instead of going, okay, what is it that's actually going wrong? I've got a foot pain or I've got a headache. And then you Listen can actually you can actually communicate yes. with your body and find out whereabouts it is. You can pinpoint the exact area that it is instead of walking into the hospital and going, "I think I've got a damaged leg," and then you'll be able to tell them exactly where it hurts, exactly what it is. Most of the time, you probably wouldn't even need to go to the doctor because you'll go, "Oh, okay, this is solved by this problem or this problem," and then you'll be able to come to a conclusion and then hopefully help yourself without using external. Um, support, but Eventually, I'm not saying I'm not. I'm definitely not saying don't go for the external support because there are some times when a doctor or a hospital yes. is is greatly appreciated. Yes, and it still is, and it will be for yes. quite some time on this planet until we really feel and get in touch with who we are and our emotions, our body, and really start to listen to our body and, and command the body. Yes, yes, very good. It's definitely. very miraculous how. Uh, my thought was, before you started speaking about sickness, my thought was, yes, that was the last thing I wanted to discuss in the webinar, the last minute. It's right now is the time to speak about, before closing, to about sickness. And while I was thinking that, you started speaking about sickness. And yes, that you said exactly what I wanted to say. There are two types of diseases and sicknesses and disorders. One is disbalance and something and another one is uh, I would say fully manifested irreversible, uh, irreversible thing. Like if you lose a leg in our physical sort of consensus reality it's really hard to grow it back or if you lost a tooth or if uh, there is something something which is surgically already treated. So. So that is one thing, uh, but uh, in most cases it is disbalanced. In most cases, and um, and disbalances are very well in power of a human to 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 heal by by healing and thinking and going into different practices. And one of the most important way of healing disbalance is to change your state, to change your from from one niche to another. So there are two niches and from one niche to another you have been here. If you move to a different state then you are uh, you're, you're often your your problem just disappears and even forget about it. Uh, even, even the physical physical problems which already manifested physically and you can clearly see them. Uh, sometimes the miracles happen and cancer disappears. Sometimes a uh, tumor just just disappears and goes away, and a lot of things are connected to you know treated by prayer and things uh, and and uh, energy. Uh, by the way, the Peter, uh, my friend Peter, who died today, uh, he was also my age, 50 years old. Uh, he faced that problem that he had cancer and he was a Reiki master and a very advanced uh, light worker, very very telepathic and psychic. So he had the choice to go through chemotherapy and all other stuff, or to or to not or not. And he had made he made his choice, and um, he didn't go into chem chemotherapy. And 
and uh, a miracle didn't happen. He didn't he didn't uh, heal. He died. Uh, he didn't tell anyone, by the way. He only told when 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 he already was in the hospital in one of the latest like three weeks ago. It was already closed. So. So that was his choice, and miracles sometimes happen, sometimes they don't. Um, and what do you make out of this? We just take it as it is. Basically, death is is what it is. It's it's not something super bad. It is something expected, but it is obviously not not something very good. Uh, it, it and again, it depends. It depends on perspective. From higher perspective, it is something. Very, very expected. I mean, people die every second on on Earth, and it, it's absolutely expected. I have to leave a little soon. Can I just add something? Oh, of course. Um, it's about yes. going back to earlier about what you were saying about missing people yes. after they have life. Yes. It's, uh, my realization on it is that it's because you never spend enough time with that person. That's the reason why you feel the longing and the missing of them, that you never really got to know them in the way that you wanted to, in the way that you could have. And that is, that's one, one reason why you miss, miss your loved ones when they passed away. Because usually there's regret that's tied with that. That can also play a big part, yeah. Yes. Um, I had a very... One of the closest my uh, people to me was my grandfather. We had a very nice connection, and he lived in a different place, in a different town, f far away from me, from Moscow. And uh, and I called him once, called him once in a while, and uh, he wrote to me often. But every time I called him, and, and he lived much longer than expected. Typical expectation in Russia was about 60 years, and he lived till 90. And for me, it was uh, every time I called him, I was afraid that you know that uh, he wouldn't be well, and that I might have missed. So, so that shadow of fear, I think, uh, shadowed our relationship because I guess it wasn't a big shadow, but but my motivation to call him was because I was was afraid that you know I, I would miss him or he would die. But um, I learned maybe that that time or later that maybe it's nice to you know to block that fear and to grow the relationship based on on something much more positive. So I I propose to you that you know whoever you love uh, don't. Communicate with them because of fear of losing them, but because of some higher joy. Appreciate what is there, not what, what you can lose. Tell them you love them as much as you can. Just tell them as much as you can how much you do love them. Be open, even if you don't get on. Believe me. I might divulge more, more in the future about my, my, my what happened two years ago to me, but um, yeah, just tell them how much you love them. Okay, I've got to go. Say, I'll say goodbye on that, so I've got to go. All right, bye-bye. Thank you. Press, Matt, Jim, and Bye, Sephira. I'm Thank sorry, I'm sorry, Rory, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I'm sorry. No, it's what well, is the right time, right? right uh, yeah. But before I go, okay. um, I was thinking to summarize. summarize. You can't, we can't cover every topic again, but I mean about death and dying. How would you summarize? I would summarize by saying there is no death the way we think of it, and there's only transformation from different levels and vibrations and learning. Uh, however, people do miss each other, and that's valid, and that's okay. And <laughs> yeah, H how would you summarize this webinar, Max? Let me do a meditation, and I will try to summarize it in my meditation. Okay, great. All right, Thank I'll do the blessing. Mm -hmm. um, Mm. Much love, much love, much love, much love. Death and birth are both the ends of life and both the beginnings of life. The death 
is the birth of another existence. If you look at life from the beginning to the end, it is very physical, very old, very animal. But walk the life from the end to the beginning and you will just realize that the whole perception transforms. The whole movie is rolling backwards, and a death is a birth, and a birth is a death. They're both sides, they're both ends of the same physical existence. When you see death, be yourself. When you experience news of death. Become more of yourself. Like the wind, it will shake not what is belongs to you, it will shake it from you, it will shake the dust from you and reveal your true most profound features. May the difficulties of life, make the grief enlighten you and raise your vibration. Make the difficulties and the grief raise your vibration. May the grief and difficulties make you more vibrant and more successful. Of course your success is your choice. You choose what is most dear for you. Your success is what you choose, whatever you want to achieve. When you experience the grief, be a healer. Send the healing energy to the soul which is parting now. Send the healing energy to yesterday, to the day before yesterday, to this person in the past. Send the healing energy to close friends, relatives, dear ones. Send the healing energy to yourself. Accept is that it is. Death is what it is. It's not more than it is. It's not less than it is. Let it take its place. Let it take its path, its turn. Don't fight what you cannot stop. When, you, when the rain pours on you, don't fight the rain, just take an umbrella. When the grief pours on you, don't fight it. Put the block and say, whatever good I remember about this person, I will keep. Whatever is hurting my good remembering of this person, I will block. That's easy. Take, invite something good, invite everything good, invite love and block the grief. Your responsibility is to be yourself and to be yourself as full as you can. So take it easy, take it with, with sadness, take it with love, take it with joy, be in harmony and keep the balance no, no matter what. Be yourself no matter what. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Max, very much. And I wish you Thank a nice you, weekend. Max. You're going camping, right, Max? You said? Yes, right now, packing and loading the car, yes. Well, thank you for doing the seminar, despite the fact that you we had your weekend off. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you, Max. Thank you for participation, and it was a uplifting experience. We should do more. Thank of you, Max. Such Thank webinars. you, everybody. Thank you, Mary, Thank for you. being here. Bye. And your participation. Thank you. Bye, Brian. See you later. Bye, bye, bye Brian. Bye, yeah. Dan. Love bye, Mary. Yeah. Love all of you. Much love to everyone. Have a brilliant day. Bye.